But before we continue um, with the scientific plotting libraries, let's take a step back and look at the common thread of this entire lecture. So what do we want to do here? And these are a few slides from the first week. Um, we told you that Python is better than MATLAB, Java, C++, or R for scientific programming. Okay, and so first of all, what does scientific in this context, scientific programming, even mean? Well, it means working with numbers and data sets, right? So having data, which is created, for example, due to experiments you made yourself, or simply a data set, um, if you want to simply do data science and working with this data, exploring this data, finding statistical relevant information, statistically relevant information in this data and handling this in general such that you can jump to conclusions. And for this, the de facto standard so far before Python was, so by now Python is the de facto standard, but before that, they were mostly MATLAB and R because they are basically made with this in mind. So they're good for working with data because they have a lot of libraries for statistical analyses of any kind or for simply working with the kind of data frame um, which well, Python then copied um, under the name Pandas, right? So we want to work with data and we're looking at all the libraries which are about handling data and python is really good at these and so and has all this stuff for working with data which we normally all, only knew from stuff like MATLAB, uh, like matlab or r and since pandas we are mainly dealing with stuff that python copied or borrowed from other languages most importantly R, because the concept of data frames comes from R, the statistical programming language. However, Python is a general purpose programming language, so you can do more stuff than just the statistics, but the statistics stuff is pretty much like R. So the concept of data frames are actually a lot of what we're doing this week, because the ggplot is a part of a library which is originally invent, um, developed in R, which you see also in the syntax. But Python is nice because Python allows this. We have heavily borrowed syntax from R, but Python can do. And in two weeks, we're looking at a library for statistical analysis, statistical analysis. And this is also basically coming right from R, but we can do it in Python. This is what we want to show you. Okay. So when looking again at our path through scientific Python, where we started at the core, we started with Python and Jupyter and the tools like Git and the debugger. And then we went over to NumPy matplotlib and pandas, Cypher we're going to see next week, Start model, stats models is the thing I just said, heavily borrowed syntax from, uh, from R, and other libraries which are higher in an, a higher hierarchy and a higher level on the hierarchy basically. So we started at the core and well we look at the tools that help you for scientific programming. So working with a lot of nonlinear and exploratory code for experiment analysis, data science, even astronomy. So Jake van der Plaas, who is tutorial and lectures we're using a lot of the time, is an astronomer and he says Python is great. And he developed, for example, he's the core developer of Altea, the nicest um, visualization library there is in Python. And so all of, so Python is good for all of this. And what we're looking at helps you with just that. So we learned the Python programming language as foundation for all of our work at, at first. We looked at Jupyter Lab as environment for exploratory work. And it's perfect for this because we can write scientific documents where we have not only the code, but also our results and our nice plots, which can even be interactive as we see this week, inside this document. We look at tools like Git and the debugger to improve your workflow. We look at NumPy and Pandas to handle your data. And this we did the last two weeks. And then we look at matplotlib and other plotting libraries to visualize the data and for exploratory data analysis, like finding statistically meaningful stuff in your data. Then in the future, we're gonna look at SciPy and stats models for statistical analysis, as well as performance optimization methods if the above was too slow. Okay, and all of this is in our common theme of Python for scientific programming. So the core stuff here, Python, IPython, JupyterGit, and, uh, and SciPy 
So these are the basic tools you need. And then we want to show you your workflow. So imagine you make an experiment. So we want to show you the library to make the experiment, experiment for example, to extract the data using NumPy and Pandas, visualize your data using matplotlib, ggplot, which is plot9, uh, Altea and the other libraries, and analyze your data using starts models and scipy. So this is basically the red thread and the common theme. So we want Python for scientific programming. And that's Python's a good candidate for this because it uses syntax, it's object oriented and can also be programming procedural. It's free not only for you but also for your customers. So even if you have MATLAB, your customers may not and then they have to pay several thousand euros. So source, we can look into the algorithms and see what they're doing. We can even improve them if we have the knowledge um, NumPy and the other library, like and many other libraries, are really performant. Even though Python itself is not that performant, we can generally wrap C or other high-performance languages. Python is a huge, huge, huge ecosystem, and so on, so on. So it's a really a good library. That's so we like Python because it fits all of what we're doing while being incredibly easy. It's like writing execu executable pseudocode, as Jack Vanderplas said. Okay, and now how far are we in our timeline? Well, like I said, we started with the basic stuff and then so far we've already seen how to work with your data, framing, cleaning, exploring and analyzing your data with pandas. Now we're looking at statistical interactive visualization and then we're going to look at statistical analyses as well as creating experiments using experiments in the f experiment and then optimizing your code uh, in the future. Okay, I hope this kind of gets you back to the common theme of this lecture. So we want to work with data. We want to have scientific programming here. All right.